Hey everybody, it's Professor Fiore here, and today we're going to look at conditionals. In other words, ways of branching in the program. We're going to look at two things, basically. The if-else construct and the switch case. Now, without any kind of branching or conditional, we basically have a straight line program, which is about as exciting as looking at a 2 by 4 In other words, we can enter values in with scanfs, we can do some computation, manipulation, and then print some values out. That's about really all we can do. Now that's useful, but that's not really where the power is. All right, so we are going to look first at our if-else structure. So the basic form of this is if, then we have a test condition in here, which we'll look at in a moment. And there's a block of possible code. So this could be all kinds of stuff in here. And then optionally, there is an else clause. We don't have to have it, but we can. And again, there can be all kinds of crazy stuff inside here. Like what? Well, print statements, scan apps, computations, more if statements, you know, really pretty much any legal C code you can put in here. Okay, notice there's no semicolon here, there's no semicolon here. The semicolon would actually stop or complete the if clause. In other words, you'd have an empty if. Nothing would happen here if you put a semicolon here. The only exception really is um, if you just had a single line, like maybe I had a printf in here, oops, something like this. You can do something kind of like this. Uh, you don't need the braces because basically this guy right there sort of closes up that clause. Otherwise, you're going to want to put uh, braces in here because if you tried to do something like this, you're going to have an error because this scan f is not seen as part of the if. This semicolon is what associates. That's what ends the clause, so to speak. So if you want multiple stuff in here, then you're going to have to have the, uh, oops, the uh, braces, right? So that makes a block. That makes a statement block. Okay. Remember, unlike something like Python, C doesn't really care about the indenting. We just do the indenting to make it easy to see, right? Easy to read, like paragraphs. Okay, so what's what's our test in here? Well, there's lots of things we can do. Um, typically, we would have, I'll start with something straightforward, like comparing two variables. All right, so I want to compare a variable like A to B. What um, What do I do in here? Okay, let's make a list of things we could do. First thing, I want to check for equality. That's a double equal sign. Remember, a single equal sign is an assignment. So think of this as same as, right? Two of them, same as. And then the single equal sign, remember we said, think of that as gets. All right, so when you see this, you read it as gets, like A gets the value of B plus C, and this, you read that as same as. So we could say something like, if A same as B, then do this. Otherwise, else, do this other thing. But again, the else is optional. You don't necessarily have to do that. Okay, other things we can do. Um, the... Exclamation point is the universal negate in C. So this is not same as, right? Not equal to. You can say, is it greater than? Is it less than? Um, is it greater than or equal to? Is it less than or equal to? Right? Okay. We also have three other things we can do. Like I said, we can do not by itself. So this just inverts the logic. And then we have two logical operators. We have 
logical or or relational or not to be confused with the single one, which was the bitwise or. These are not the same thing. And we have a logical and, which is not to be confused with, you guessed it, bitwise and. All right, so essentially what ends up happening here, and here is, the question is, is this true? So what do we mean by true? In C, false is zero. Anything else is, in other words, uh, non-zero is taken as true. Any value. So, you know, the, the, the expression in here could evaluate to zero, it could evaluate to 17, it could evaluate to minus 32. In other words, you could have something um, in terms of a computation. I'll show you some examples in, in a sec. And all we really do is check to see, is this thing uh, zero or non-zero? If it's zero, then it's false. If it's non-zero, then it's true. Um, often we use true, non-zero, we say exists. Like if A exists, meaning if it has a non-zero value, then we can go and do something. So, you know, other things we might do in here. All right, so we could say is, um, you know, is B greater than or equal to uh, C plus D? All right, so we can evaluate this. That's not just necessarily two things, A compared to B, B compared to C. All right, you can do something a little bit more complicated. This could be the return value from a function. You could have a function that, uh, I'll just call it foobar here, that you know does some kind of computation and it returns a value. So the return value will tell me, you know, do I take the if or not? For example, we might have, um, we might have foobar return zero on success and then a numeric value if it fails and that numeric value could be a failure code. So I could know how it failed. Right? There's some pretty extensive things here. And there's ways of doing things in you know, different ways to achieve the same result. So we could say something like, um, if A is the same as zero, or you could say that like this, if not A, All right? Because a would be evaluated to be, like I said, either zero or non-zero. If that's a little fuzzy to you, then consider the following. Let me just copy this. I'll modify it. So what if we said if A is not the same as zero? All right, if A. That makes sense, All right? If it's not the same as zero, meaning if there's some value, some positive or negative value, that's the same as thing if A, you know, there's a value there. Obviously, these ways here at the end, these ways are a little bit more compact. So you'll often see programmers do it this way rather than this way. But, you know, for now, whatever whatever's clearest to you is probably the way you should do it. Now, we can also... All right, so we've seen the negate down here. We can also use these logical ands and ors. So you can say something like, oh, let's say if A is greater than B or C is the same as D. All right, so it's an or, this must be true, or this must be true. They could both be true, but at least one of them has to be true in order for the if clause to be taken. If neither of these things are true, then you know we take the else clause, whatever's inside there. We could rewrite this. And, right, logical and. So this must be true. This must be true. They must both be true for this to be taken. Although if one of them is not true, then, or maybe both of them, but at least one of them is not true, then we'll come down here into the else. All right, a common error that people 
will do is this. They use the bitwise instead of the um, instead of the logical, and this can get you into all sorts of trouble. So let's take a quick example. Like I'm going to say, if A and B, what does this mean? Well, I'm basically checking to see if A is non-zero, and I'm checking to see if B is non-zero. So you know, maybe I don't know. Let's say, let's throw some numbers in here. Let's say A is set to one and b is set to 2. All right, so I look at this and go, OK, if a is, OK, 1 is non-zero, b, OK, that's non-zero. This is non-zero. This is non-zero. They're both non-zero. Yay! So we'll come in here. We'll do this, All right? But what happens if you do that? Now you're bitwise anding a and b. So what's a bitwise and between an a and between 1 and 2? Well, the bitwise and on that is zero. So the result of this computation is zero. Eh, too bad. This version's going to get you down here in the else. This is a, a pretty insidious little bug because sometimes, you know, depending on the values that you're using, you might you might think this works, you know, because you have the uh, the bitwise here instead of the logical or vice versa, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, sometimes it'll appear to work and sometimes it won't. You know, it all depends on what the bit patterns turn out to be. So be careful. Here's another one that'll get a lot of new programmers. Um, I want to check to see if A is 1. Right? If A is same as 1, specific value. What happens if I do this? This is doing something entirely different. This assigns the value 1 to A. In other words, A gets 1. And then it checks to see if the result is non-zero. That's not the same thing. Now, in this particular case, it'll still come out true. In other words, we'll still wind up in this part of the uh, code, in the if part of the code. But in the first case, you know, if A is 16, let's say, it fails this and comes down here into the else. In this version, it actually overwrites the 16. It turns A into 1 and then does this. Oops. Not what you probably want to do, right? So that's a very common thing. Um, a trick that some people do is they do this backwards. So... You know, one gets a no, nah, no, nah, that doesn't work that way, right? You have to have a variable over here on this assignment, but you can do this. That's perfectly legal. So sometimes people write these in reverse so that they don't accidentally use you know, the wrong symbol here. Like I said, stop calling it equals. Just get rid of that word. Same as gets. There is no equals. No, there is no equals. There is only same as and gets. Okay. That's the first bit. No pun intended. I also told you there was a thing called switch case. What's going on with that? Well, imagine you have a situation where you have a lot of ifs and elses sort of cascaded. Like maybe you've got a variable over here. I'll just use A again. And I want to check it for a bunch of different values. Like maybe you got like a menu, right? And there's like item one, item two, item three, item four, item five. So you could say, okay, if it's if it's A, if he chose A, if the user chose A, then you know do this thing. Otherwise, let's see if they chose B. So I can put this, excuse me, to see if they chose two. Okay, so if they chose two, then we'll do, you know, whatever the heck this is. Otherwise, now we'll do this other stuff. Uh, what's the other stuff? Well, maybe there's, a, you know, choice three. Right? Now, like, think of just a menu, you know, um, any program, word processor, simulator, whatever. You, so you can imagine these things just keep on going and going and going and going, right? So you got 
87 choices. So this thing is just going to get further and further and further. Um, you know, if this is really big, what ends up happening, of course, is eventually your code, you know, winds up way the heck over here. And it's just not a lot of fun. It gets you know, visually kind of ugly. Um, if you have this sort of situation where there's just a set of values you're going to cycle through, switch is perfect for this. So here's what you do. You have your, your variable, right? So I could say like switch on, uh, I'll use A again, what the heck. And then I have a series of cases. So I'd say like case one. And then I would have some code in here, right? Like uh, I'll just throw in a printf. And maybe I got a bunch of them. When I'm done, I just say break. Then I can go on to case two. And I have some other code in here. You know, maybe I do a little computation. Um, break again. These don't have to be in ascending order, you know, case one, case two, case three. They're just the, the values that A could be, you know what I mean? So this could be like case five, and you've got some code in here. And put another printf in, just sort of a blank thing. Um, if you don't put the if you don't put the break in there, then it falls through. In other words, so like if if a is five, it'll come in here. It'll do this printf, but there's no break, so it'll just fall right into here and do this printf as well. That's sometimes useful. Sometimes you can just like tack up a whole bunch of these. Like if in a particular situation, if you know cases seven and eight both did the same thing, you can just do this. All right, and you just put however much code in there you need until eventually you say break. And then if there's sort of a catch-all for like other stuff, like typically like an error an error catch, there's the default. So this is basically everything else. Put your code in here, um, you know, whatever is an error message, and then you can have a break. If that's the last one, there's really no need for the break. It's um, redundant. But anyway, there's there's your structure, right? It's a nice sort of linear, stacks up real nice. So doing things like menu handling, switch case is great. It's beautiful. There's nothing you can't do with the if. Right? I mean, you you can do this with an if statement, a whole bunch of cascaded if-else statements. Um, but in this particular case, the uh, the structure of it, it lends itself very nicely to something like a memory, excuse me, a, um, like a menu tree. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. This is kind of contrived, admittedly. What I've got here is a little program that uh, basically just checks if one number wholly goes into another number. In other words, um, is it an integer multiple of it, right? 12 is an integer multiple of 3. 17 is not an integer multiple of 5. Uh, and I've set this up to independently check integers and doubles, um, real numbers and, and integers. So here's, the, here's main, okay? And I just call this divisor test. And the very first thing we're going to do is decide, do I want to check integers or do I want to check for real numbers? So we ask the user, okay? Because we say type in, right? Type in one for integers, two for real numbers. Scan off. So we get this C. Don't forget the ampersand. We got to tell it where C is. Now we're going to do a switch case. So they could either type in a 1 for an integer, so I'm going to call this function called check ints, and I'll come back to this in a sec. If it was case 2, they typed in a real number, then we'll do this thing called check doubles. If they type in anything else, that's default, and we just come back and say, hey, that was not a valid choice. All right? so notice how the switch works out pretty well here. Now, what are these two guys? Check ints, check doubles. Notice I've got some uh, prototypes, function prototypes. They return integer values, they take no arguments. So this if, 
right? if check int. So this is returning something interesting. And then it says the first integer is not an integer multiple of the second. Otherwise, it says first integer is an integer multiple of the second. Okay. So let's come down here and look at this. So here's check ints. Right, well, let's see if I can go far enough and see them both. Almost. Check ints and check doubles. Um, this little comment thing, this is a good habit to get into. So here's the name of the function. It describes the function. What does it do? This requests two integers from the user. It tells you arguments. None, because it's a void. Right? Return value. Zero if the second divides into the first wholly. Otherwise, it returns one. Here's our check doubles. It's virtually identical, except it deals with real numbers. It real, does doubles instead of integers. So these two functions are very, very similar. Really, the only difference is this is declared for integers. This is declared for doubles. These scan Fs are doing a percent LF. These scan Fs are doing a percent D. The way it actually checks is slightly different. They're both using a modulo, right? A mod B. In this case, we use a function from the math library called F mod. It basically does the same thing, but for floating point numbers. So let's just take a look at what this does. Ask the user, enter the first integer, do a scan F on that, grab, grab that, put it in A. Enter the second integer, grab that, put it in B. A mod B. Well, if they go in wholly, if B goes into A wholly, there is no return, um, excuse me, there is no um, remainder. In other words, this will evaluate to zero. If it does go in wholly, in other words, we return a zero. Return zero if second divides into the first wholly. Make sense? You could actually return, instead of doing zero and one, you could actually return um, A mod B but I'm doing it this way specifically because I want, you know, in my contrived little example here, the specific value of one rather than just some number. Okay. This does the same thing. F mod basically does uh, A mod B for floating point values. It does the same kind of thing though. So we return a one or a zero. And those values come back here right, in these if statements. And if it's true, then we get this statement. Otherwise, we get that statement. All right, so let's uh, do an example here. Okay, so what do you want to do? Uh, I don't know, let's do integers. Okay, sounds good to me. First integer, 12. Second integer, three. Yep, the first integer is an integer multiple of the second. Beautiful. Uh, let's try a different set of numbers. Let's do the integers again. Uh, let's do 34, second integer, 5. Oh, it's not an integer multiple of the second. Oh, gee whiz. Okay. Try it one more time. Sure, why not? Let's do some reals this time. First real number is 34.5. The second real number is 2.17. I don't think that goes in evenly. It's not an integer multiple of the second. Okay. All right. Yeah, I know this is kind of a goofy little contrived program, but it's here just to show how this all works, right? These are what I call do nothing useful programs. In other words, they're not something you're going to, you know, use every day. They're here just to illustrate what's going on. So there you go. You get your switch, switch case. You even got the default over here. Oh, you know, we didn't even check that. Let's do that. Okay. I want choice five. That was not a valid choice. Okay. Right. I want to check everything, make sure they all work. Now, this is not bulletproof. There are other things we can do, and you can try this yourself, right? I'll leave you with this little thought. What happens if you throw in zero for the second integer? Hmm. If you were dividing, what would happen if you try to divide by zero? That's an error, right? Kablooey. How do you fix that? Is there a way that you could modify this program so that if the person entered zero for the second integer, the second real number, you would avoid that sort of software explosion? Right? Try it yourself, see what actually happens, and then see if you can fix it. Okay, so this... This whole idea really takes us into a new realm of being able to have our programs do cool stuff.
The next thing we're going to look at sort of builds on this idea, and that's the idea of looping. So we can run code over and 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 over again, do stuff really fast, because that's what computers are good at, doing things really fast, but, you know, a gazillion times. Okay? We'll see you then.